to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please turn on your mics. <coughs> we'll have a roll call first. Uh, Gail Ames. Here. Jeff Pilon. Present. Kelly Carroll. Yes. Barry Wagner. Yes. Jason Alders. Yes. Kristen Moll. Here. Harold Jorgensen. Present. And Robert Schiller. Yep. And Elizabeth Stockman. Here. Okay, the next thing we'll have the clerk read the meeting policy. The agenda is printed or amended will be followed so all necessary and needed actions by the Planning and Zoning Commission will be addressed. The agenda can be amended, amended by proper motion. Business from the floor is welcome and allowed for on our agenda. When comments from the floor are made, you must first be recognized by the chairman. Second, state your name and address for the record. And third, you'll have no more than three minutes to state your comments and concerns. There are copies of the agenda available in the back of the room. There is a sign-up sheet, too, if you want to speak on floor items. And please turn your cell phones off. Thank you. Okay. This time, I'm going to ask if there's any floor items. Any floor items? Yes, Mr. Chair? Yes. We need to uh, approve the agenda. Okay. Sorry. First of all, we're going to we're going to ask for a mo uh, motion to approve or amend tonight's meeting agenda. I'll make a motion. I'll second it. Okay. Commissioner Pearl made the motion. The second was by Jason uh, Alders. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Next thing is to approve the amendment September 27, 2018 planning and zoning meetings. Do we have a motion to approve this? Mr. Chair, that would be February 27th. Pardon me? February 27th. February 27th. I'll make a motion, motion to approve the meeting minutes. Um, Jason uh, Alders made him a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Uh, Commissioner. Uh, Moore made the second. We have any discussion? Seeing no discussion, we'll call for the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, we'll again I'll repeat the floor items. Seeing there's no floor items, we'll go ahead and we'll open the public hearing. And the public hearing is a request by Jeffrey Anderson for property owned at 6538 213th Avenue Northwest regarding the following two matters. Number one, a lot split to divide 19.88 acre parcel and creating one new lot, parcel A, containing the exist existing house and measuring 9.59 acres. A new house will be built on parcel B, which measures 10.29 acres and will contain the existing pole shed. The second thing is a, a conditional use permit to allow <coughs> access by the flag lot 67.75 foot strip of land to the existing house along the exi existing driveway from 213th Avenue. Driveway access to the new parcel will be from Balsam Street, Sleep Slopes, and Wetland Maker. Access to the property is challenging. <coughs> At this time, we're going to ask the uh, our planner to present. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, if you recall, in January of this year, Mr. Anderson came forth in with a concept plan to subdivide his land. At which time, uh, you made a recommendation to proceed with the flag lot via the public hearing and the conditional use permit. Um, Mr. Anderson decided to, or really had to, leave the lot for the new home on 10 acres based on the size of the existing coal shed so that that meets the ordinance requirements. So it's just a two lot split. The existing home is going to be accessed by the 67.75 foot strip. And the new home, uh, on the survey that you see, a building pad location there. Uh, will be accessed by a, a salt street. Uh, the engineer 
had very minor comments. Uh, we need a little bit of work on the legal description and the wetland delineation needs to be finalized. So I have broken out the conditions of approval in the findings at the very end of the packet uh, into two sections, one referencing the conditional use permit conditions and the other referencing the lot split conditions. Uh, our office does recommend approval of the lot split. Uh, he does meet the requirements under the terms that we amended our ordinance back in 2015 to allow these types of situations uh, for unique parcels. So if there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer those now. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask the applicant if he has any, any, any additions or statements they want to make on it. Uh, no, I mean, we went over everything when I was here before. And Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask the clerk to verify the legal publications and mailings and postings have been completed. Yes. Okay. This time, uh, <coughs> we're going to open it up for the public. If there's any comments out there, anybody wants to make any comments at this public hearing about this? Seeing none. <coughs> Does the commission have any discussions or questions here? Uh, I believe it was in here at our, our February meeting, and we went over this quite thoroughly. Uh, are there any additional questions we'd like to ask? This next page you got where it says uh, recommended by the planning and zoning in January of 2018. Why do they have this one piece on here that's five acres that would be pulled out from or that would be sold off of that 10 acres? Now that's that must have been something that you wanted to do originally. That was part of the original. Pardon me, Mr. Chair. So this really doesn't mean anything. Yes. It, right. It's only going to be it, two pieces. It was. We had talked about splitting it initially, and then. We realized this given the size of that existing pole barn, we really had to keep it together. Yeah, if for some reason that pole barn could ever run away, we you know there may be potential in the future to split into two fives, but he's not asking for that right now, so it'll just be the two big lots. Go back then. Anybody in public have any comments they'd like to make at this time? Is there any more questions here for the planning and zoning? Like I say, we went this over this pretty good in February. You have a question, Commissioner Perro? No, I was actually going to ask you if you close the public hearing. Okay, if there's no more questions, uh, we'll close the public hearing. Now, the only thing, the only thing that the, I'm not sure if everything's clear with the engineer yet. Uh, um, if he's okayed everything, uh, has he? Uh, well, there was a memo in your packet from okay. the engineer, so those conditions. Uh, we'll have to approve it with those conditions. Correct, and that's made. That's part of the findings. So if you re reference the the findings, uh, it'll all be approved as one. Then. So, 
I'll open it for a motion to get somebody to uh, make this. Uh, if not, I'll make the motion that we, uh, with the uh, findings the engineer had, that, that, that this is carried through, that uh, we go ahead and approve this. Do we have a second? I'll second it. And that's with the CUP also. It's both of these, right? Pardon me? This is with the CUP also. This yes. Is, so the motion, okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Schiller. Schiller. I've got to keep get the name straight. Yeah. Schiller made the second. Any, any discussion on this? Seeing there's no discussion, we'll call for the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. So your next step is go to the uh, planning and zoning on the fourth. Council. City Council. City Council on the second Tuesday. Okay, so I I'll talk to you about the work session. It's probably more makes more sense from there. Um, the, I will just email you. So it'd be the first. It would be May the third. Yeah, yeah. May third is a Thursday. Right, same location, same time. Well, that comes a little later. Yeah, after we get your final delineation and all that. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk after that and get everything in order. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> the next thing Here. is, <clears throat> go ahead. Just clarify, so when we do bring it up at the council. Okay. The item number nine. It's supposed to be a review and comment by the fire chief. Is that comment that's in there? Fire chiefs or somebody else's, but generally speaking. Um, are you talking about on the conditionals? I'm sorry. Yeah. That, that Page is four, good. number nine. That is um, generally what we do is provide the plans to the fire chief to review. So that is from our ordinance under our flag lot um, regulations. That number nine, and so generally speaking, that's what we've done in the past: is just provided a plan to the fire chief and have him take a look at it. So you're still waiting for the fire chief's comments? Yeah, we have. I haven't even forwarded it yet, <clears throat> so I will do that. We should have that before the workshop, and then on number twelve on page five, mm -hmm. another fire chief should comment on the surfacing of the existing driveway. Right. So we can get those added to the packet for the uh, council meeting that their workshop that would be appreciated. Sure thing. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Is that all in? Is this something that we should do? <laughs> Whenever we have a conditional use permit? For the fire chief? Permit? Yes. Because no, this was something specific to the flag lot. Yeah, the, uh, but we've never did this before at, at, about the fire chief that I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did. Did we? Mm -hmm. Yep. We've had him look at several things. Um, but not every conditional use permit needs that. It just depends on the configuration of the site and what's going on. Because, you know, sometimes those flag lots can go down to 33 feet and, yeah, it, you know, it's fairly narrow, depending on what the paved width of the driveway is or even if it's paved. Because there's no problem with it because there's plenty of width. In it. I agree. I don't think there's a real problem. I mean, there's even uh, space enough to turn around up near the house. You know, it may not be a paved area completely for a fire truck, but, you know, those are the kinds of comments we're looking for. I don't think there's any trees or anything like that that would prevent their access, the truck, big trucks. Yeah, because I know I was out and looked at the site, and, it, and it, there's, I don't see anything where there would be a problem. Pretty open, yeah. Yeah. I agree. Mr. Chair? Yes. That is one of the things that you want to consider. I know when the fire department had a call across the road from me, they, there's three flag lots there, and they had to put their pool out at the road and run hoses all the way to the farthest lot in the back because they couldn't turn the trucks around up there. They, they built on a, the edge of a hill, so they had to walk out 
on the edge of the hill, and the front yard was such that they couldn't turn the trucks around. So they were running hoses all the way from five, 500, 600 feet back. And uh, so the trucks were turned around in the road to go refill, but the, they were running hoses all the way down. So Should this be part of the uh, engineer's report? Well, it's, that's why you have the fire chief checking it out. So if they're going to, you know, if they're going to be building on on a lot, you got to make sure it's accessible. The new lot would be off of basalt. Mm -hmm. You just want to make sure that the fire chief agrees that they can get a truck in there and turn around should they have to have emergency services. Which is part of the reason we also got our new rescue trucks, so they don't have to run engines down these long driveways when they can avoid it. So. But I, I still can't recall that we've ever dealt with a fire sheep on any, any of these issues. Yeah, we, we have in the past. We have? Yeah. You remember her? Well, I just don't. there's times when we should have used it. We should have, no question. Yeah, no, there's a lot down comes off of 181st down there. I'm sure you can't get in there with a, a fire truck because they couldn't even get in there with the ready mix trucks. Mm -hmm. That's a good example, just to use them as an example of if you had to go in there in a fire truck right and when there was a lot of snow, I don't know what you'd do. The uh, trees are so close. <clears throat> you know. well, I think this is very important because we've always <laughs> included the engineer's report, but... Uh, no, I think that that's a good thing to have that in there. I, I, I think it's a good idea too, but I, I just don't recall where we've ever, ever had a fire chief's report. And I, I may be wrong, I just I don't remember. And Mr. Chair, then, and just again, so that we're, we're feeding the best information to the council because yes. again, this is where we need to be thorough so the council can take the recommendation and and proceed because the questions have been asked here. So you want to make sure that you've considered all the conditions as presented by by staff so that you can say, do we agree with all of those? Is there anything that's going to need clarification? Because at the council meeting, we won't have the same opportunity as you do at a public hearing to to make sure you've considered all the conditions. So you want to make sure sometimes. Depending on, on, on what it rigorous <coughs> is, you may want to go through those and say, okay, you know, here's the 15 conditions of what they are. Anybody have any questions or clarifications we should we should bring up now? But if there are conditions, you want to make sure that those are called out so they're done before the workshop, and it doesn't delay them further because then we ask the questions that weren't answered here. So. <clears throat> okay, uh, I, th I think we've clarified that now from now on. We'll just make sure that we do cover this. On the, on the, I think it's very important that we cover it. Uh, I, I, like I say, I just I don't ever recall that we ever covered it at the planning and zoning. But anyway, uh, uh, let's go on to the next thing. We're, we're going to be working on the uh, on the uh, discussion continued on this uh, having to do with cell, cell phones, and we'll, we'll turn it back over to our... Uh, this doctor in our planner. Thank you. Well, there's a lot to this. Um, I spent quite a bit of time putting this memo together uh, to try to outline for you what the new statute covers, the types of things that it regulates. Um, I guess the most important thing to know is that we cannot prohibit the small cell or um, the distributed antenna system technology in the city. We have to allow it. Um, the state does give the local units of government some say in where it goes and how it looks. And those are probably the two most important things. Um, you know, the functioning aspect is important too, but that's something that's typically handled um, by the providers in how far apart the units are and that kind of thing. Um, I did add this picture tonight. It was funny after I finished the report, I was reading a magazine and this was front and center. Um, these underground cell sites, apparently you don't get quite as much distance out of those underground units as you do from the pole or above ground mounted units. Um, I've never personally spoken to any of the installers, 
I don't know if the underground units have been used anywhere in Minnesota, but that would also be something we could look into. Um, I did contact the neighboring communities, and none of our neighboring communities have adopted an ordinance, <coughs> with the exception of Elk River. They had initially prohibited small cell from coming into Elk River. Then when the state passed the new law, um, they were exempted because of their municipal utility. So they are not following the same um, statute as cities without municipal utilities. Um, Columbus, I called them just because they're similar in nature to now then. They uh, did not know what I was talking about, so I explained it to her, and they obviously have not um, adopted an ordinance <coughs> either. Um, now then does have a right-of-way uh, management section in the city code, and that currently addresses, you know, electric and cable and other typical uh, users within that corridor. So one way would be to amend our right-of-way management ordinance, or we could also put a small cell section in our zoning ordinance um, somewhere near or with the current cell tower ordinance. Um, so again, there is a lot to this. I guess the most important thing is kind of what is your general feeling? Do you feel it's important? Should you know? Do we want to keep moving forward? Uh, we can start looking at some of the details. I have several example ordinances that we could um, also look at if we uh, get into that next next month. Um, the things that were highlighted in red, starting on page three, um, are the things that are very specific in the statute about size. So that's really good to know um, that there is a limit on the size and the height uh, of these devices. And then I so the six cubic feet in volume uh, is regarding the enclosure of an antenna. And those are typically mounted on the pole. And they are different configurations. There are some pictures at the back of the report. Um, actual photographs of a couple of small cell that were mounted to poles and also there are pictures of from the city of um, I was going to say Columbus, Cincinnati uh, Cincinnati actually, I mean they're a more urban setting of course and they actually designed the poles upon which the cell equipment can be mounted. And so people and um, users can choose from metal poles or uh, wood poles. And so they made them uh, certain design standards that they thought were appealing aesthetically. Uh, that they wouldn't mind seeing in their downtown areas. So I'm not sure, you know, we may want to specify what we require in commercial industrial zones, for instance, versus what we would require or specify for the residential areas. I've got a question to ask. Mm -hmm. Can could this apply in our city now? There's some places that they do not have very good reception on the, on their cell phones. Yeah, this is intended to solve some of those problems. Yes. And this is, uh, I think you had in your newsletter something about this. 
and this, this is the yeah, we're doing what we can to get coverage throughout. And we've we've talked with some of the uh, the cell providers. Nobody so far has infrastructure close enough to us to connect, because these these aren't satellite provided. They they have to have proximity to feeder systems. That's why they're saying you can't limit them to just this part of town or how far apart they have to be, because they have to be close enough to relay the, the transmissions. So we've actually, back before CenturyLink came to town, we were looking at providers coming in from the west and using the existing cell towers and, and some of the towers to feed their way into the city. This would then get it into pockets of the community that don't have uh, hardwire infrastructure. But you also have to have something to put it on. Those parts of town that don't have utility poles because they're buried underground, this isn't going to work. You know, in, you take a look at the pictures here, those are typically street lights. You know, you've got those every so often. We don't have that same surface structure necessarily. They'd have to go on utility poles. And you know, if somebody somebody sees money to made to made to be made in it, that's fine. What Liz is doing is there's a state statute, state law now that says we have to accommodate them. How do we want to get ahead of that so that they're doing it in an organized fashion that doesn't um, negatively affect our aesthetics in the city or private property? And what, what do we want for our right-of-way uh, regulations that allow for the city to manage this? And right now, some of the right-of-way that people have put in the past literally goes down the middle of a road you know, rather than in ditches here in town. So what's one of the things that came up in our road and bridge recently when we're doing road work down, say, in the Rogers Lake area, we don't know how many of the utilities are buried in the road because it was more convenient than going off in the official right-of-way. So what we want to do is make sure that we have regulations so when people come in, we're directing them where we want them rather than them coming in and us chasing down what we should have done beforehand. Now, can it help? Yeah, if somebody sees dollars <coughs> that, that that are better than the you know the, the infrastructure cost has to out has to be less than what they can make from the sale of the service. No. So by by you know the state's already said if they're coming in we can't stop them, but we can regulate how they come in if we have an ordinance in place. Is this something we could have very simple ordinance that would cover everything? Well, not necessarily. I mean, it's not all that simple. You have to be very specific. And I think in order to address all the aspects of it, you know, it does have to be fairly detailed. But, um, you know, I think it's worth looking at. Because generally speaking, you know, the new developments have the underground electric. So like he's saying, we don't have poles there to mount these things. So are we going to require them to be underground? Are we going to require that they buy a specific pole from the city and put them on certain poles so that they're all uniform? Or would it be acceptable to the Planning and Zoning Commission to, you know, just have them mounted on power poles? But there again, if you get into some of the newer areas, then you're not going to have power poles out there. So then what do you do? And, and they need to have a continuation. You, know, you can't put one here and one there. They only reach so far. They're kind of like boosters in between the big cell towers. They need the big cell towers to work. But they do help with, you know, kind of the hills and valleys or and uh, what's the word, Not, you know, weak spots um, in the system. So. But, but according to what I heard the mayor saying here, we don't have the facilities where we could handle it in, in our city at this time, right? I'm saying that, that uniformly, no. In, in our newer developments where they bury the, the electrical cables and there aren't, we don't have street lights in most areas. And there are certain places we don't have utility poles because the utilities are buried. You know, we're, it's one of the challenges, and now then, because we are so spread out, you don't have easy access to these types of services. 
But like uh, Stockton, our planner, was saying that there could be poles put up. They, they, they put this equipment on, it would help. Hmm? Right in our community right now. Do you think that, how would poles look? I mean, how do poles look to you if they were throughout your neighborhood or throughout? Well, we've got it on a siren uh, back here. You know, Morton Farm or throughout wherever some of these subdivisions. Yes, Commissioner. <clears throat> okay, what you can do is the uh, city of Bloomington, Rosemont, and Eden Prairie, what they do is uh, if uh, one of these companies want to com come in and put a small um, um, cell pot or whatever it up, what they'll do is they'll make the cell company pay for a siren to come into the city also, and they build a, a steel pole that's actually made for the, um, the wind and stuff like that. Kind of like what you got in this picture, okay. you know, of uh, like this, for this ball field or whatever. Uh -huh. And But they put the siren on top of it, and then they put that cell tower deal around it. So you get two things going. You get better cell service, and you got the cell company to actually pay for your siren to be put into your community, because we've only got one here in the city of now then. Oh, I see. But every pole, of course, you wouldn't want the siren on every pole. No, but, but you I have a way to saying. actually make some money around the city and stuff like that or get things paid for that would help out um, public safety. Right, or if they bought a pole, right, the city could... But you'd want to do it on a steel pole. You wouldn't want to have a wood pole. And uh, so kind of like over here next to the fire station. The, the question is, what, what gets us from this pole to that pole if it's up in the north? Or, I mean, really, if we do another pole, that's where you need it because most storms come out of the south and west. So this part of the city is fairly well covered by Ramsey and Elk River when the sirens go off. Where people are lost is up in the, the northeast because the only siren we have is this one here and it doesn't necessarily carry that far up. And if the wind's coming out of the south and west, St. Francis siren noise is blowing the other way. So you'd want it up in, in that area. Um, how do we get, the question is how do you get from the existing pole here or wherever it's coming in from to those others how many repeater poles do you need between that and the one that you the bigger pole you'd have the siren on did they say did it say in here somewhere that they hook up to the fiber optic no i no, thought i says, seen something in here that said that they use fiber optic from the existing um cell um, poles or to well, all the way up um it says wireless facilities does not include wireless support structures wire lines backhaul coax or fiber electric cables utility poles. It's not that they were using the fiber between them or whatever because they just put it. I thought it said here it doesn't, does not use power supply. It's not included. The they do in the front just in regards to stadiums, hospitals, shopping malls. <coughs> they talk about it. It's one of the challenges when they're so spread out out here and you don't have the, the roads and the do, do and that, that would be a good question. How how close do the repeaters need to be? That was going to be my question. Is they have to be every half mile or every mile and a half? Or, so you talk about having three in the city or or thirty in the city? Well, that's the other right, and I think it kind of depends too on topography and you know how you go through a gully and you lose service. Or yeah, something. we're not that hilly here to. Well, that. Not, not a lot. But not yeah. a lot. Yeah. Well, the other thought I just had, too, is you could integrate the pole style with your street signs and maybe mount some of them that way, too. But again, you're going to have to be up in the air quite a bit with a pole. Right, but your street signs could be on the same pole. See, yeah. what looks uh, less aesthetic is when you keep getting, in metropolitan areas, you know, you keep getting multiple poles for different purposes. It's much more appealing to combine users on... Same Mr. Pole. Chair? Yes, Mayor. So, Liz, do you know any any cities that are more rural in nature like ours where this is being done anyway? No. I mean, obviously Ohio is a little more. Right. Well, they're, yeah, they're pretty... Um, well, that, that would be, I think, helpful. Because I like the idea of Commissioner Schiller, if we can get them to pay, obviously they're looking at bigger poles than we have. But if we can put poles in neighborhoods and the repeaters, it's close enough for the repeaters to be effective. If we can get a nice pole out of it and get good solid street signs out of it, yeah. you know, a combination of their investment and our need for good street signs. Mm -hmm. Or and, even street and, lights if the city... And I was going to say that the, the next thing that's going to happen is there'll be that debate out in the 
a place like ours, how, how much you want lit up. But right. at some point on county roads, they're going to try and light up intersections like they did in Ramsey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, but again, this is, this is the time for that discussion. So you have that in your documents before they come out here and want to start doing something. And you're chasing them instead of saying, hey, thanks for coming to our community. Here's our regulations. Had you talked talk to Tim over at Ramsey, Gladio? Yes. And he didn't want to do nothing about it, really? No, he wasn't. It wasn't, uh, you know, hot on his, wasn't at the top of his list, let's just say that. You know, I think, I think he thinks they'll eventually get to it, but it wasn't a pressing issue. See, what you would think there, with, with their infrastructure, it would make more sense. Mm -hmm. Give him some competition. Yeah, maybe it's because... You know what they're doing with with uh, Comcast? Mm -hmm. They're not looking for competition, too. I don't know. You know, I'm uh, currently working with uh, a cell company on an upgrade over here on Verde Valley to our existing tower. So I think I'll do a little research or question, ask a few questions of them, and see what they have to say. But um, your idea about researching um, more rural areas is, you know. Good. I did think of Columbus, but I'm not sure. The only but they're not doing anything yet. It's kind of no, they're not. And you know, the mentions were Bloomington and Edina, Minneapolis. Um, Rosemont's in the process of right some now. of the more dense suburbs have done them, but that density makes a huge difference. Though. Right. I mean, typically, you're going to have right. street lights. Chair. Yes, Miss Burrow. Um, a, a city that pops up that's real open and um, more urban, or I mean more rural than our than like us. It, that's nearby. I'm thinking like there's like Hamel, um, Rogers maybe, or well parts of Rogers. Parts of Rogers. I'm um, Corcoran, Hanover, Hanover, and like the south, the southwest parts. There's some big cities there off of what 55 and 94 that go out that direction, but there's lots of little ones in between. So some of those might be. And Otsego doesn't have one yet. Well, um, they don't need it. Probably. I mean, they got two big cities on each side of them. Okay. Hmm. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mayor. Can I ask Planner Stockman on page 13? 16B. Okay. Telecommunications right away users need not apply for or obtain right of way permits for facilities that are located in public right of ways on May 10th, 1997. Is that accurate? Or is this a. Um, so this was based on the statute. So that's right out of the statute. Um, no, we do ask. We do acquire permits, right, Corey, for anyone that does work in the right of way. Um, so it must have been that must have been the date that the statute changed to allow communities to require a permit. Um, that's what it's referring to. It just seems weird because it's you know you're, you're talking 20 years ago, and after that date, then you have to. Um, mm -hmm. Pretty obvious. We're after that date. Yeah. It's 20 years later. I just wonder if there was, if the state knew that was in there that way, and the way it reads, it, it sounds like it's it's current. Once you pass this date. Yeah. We're 20 years past it, so. I know. 19. Well, I think so what they did 21. is they amended, they amended previous sections, kind of like we do, but they just left that in there. So maybe they got a cut and paste? <laughs> what? They got a cut and paste issue here? <laughs> Possibly. I don't know. So not only will we lead the way <coughs> of all the neighboring communities in this, but we can help the state clean up their document. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, I do like the idea of, of making, combining everything on a pole or on, you know, similar poles and having, asking for something from the, provider at the same time you're giving them something.
On, on that same page, then, in the uh, item G just above in 15, mm -hmm. local government unit may elect to charge each small wireless facility attached to a wireless support structure owned by the local government unit a fee. So the one, two, and three, are those the limitations, or where did those numbers come from? 150 yeah. for yep, a year? Yep, those are straight out of the statute, so that is that must be the limitation. I have a copy of the statute here. So we can do 150 a year for rent, 25 for maintenance around the, the base per structure? So per, yeah, per small cell. So some of them may put in 20 of them at once, you know, in a, a line or some configuration where they communicate. Can you charge them rent if they purchase you the pool? Well, you can ma have them purchase a pole that was the city has, and then they, oh, have, gotcha. they have to put that up. So and that's, that's what you want to clarify in, in, when you put the document. You have to buy a pole from us, and the car pole, and... Right. We lease the space back to you. Yeah. I mean, it's not, not much, but 150 per year, if they have to have a lot of these, mm -hmm. it's worthwhile. Right. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. You just want to direct it so it's most effective and most attractive to the city. Right. What you don't want is randomly putting these things up. Where do you think they're going to get this pool to buy from you or buy from the city? Wouldn't you just put in there that you want to have it that it has to be a structural engineered pool for the specific use of whatever's going to be on it and the sell stuff? That's what we're here discussing. But, I, but no, you're, you're just saying it to buy it from the city. I don't know who you would buy it from from the city, mm -hmm. you know. It's not like we've got a pile of poles laying somewhere. We no, can, but, you know, we, we do buy culverts. We do buy those things. We, we certainly can go to, go to state, you know, state pricing and say, what well, other people are buying poles. You know, if, if, if this is something we want to do, we can say, we'll supply the poles. You pay for them. And, and uh, if, we're, if we're having them buy their own poles, it's going to be pretty hard to say we didn't have anything to do with it, but that's our pole you're putting in. I'm just saying if you want to have this option, you might say, we'll provide the pole, but you pay us the rent. Right. Mm -hmm. And we go to a state contract and say, who's getting metal poles that are structurally suited to this application, like we do culverts, and they come in and we provide the culvert, and they pay us a fee for that. Right. And I think you can track, too, if we go down the path of, if the pole's got a combined function as a street sign and something else, it's going to have a certain design spec for that because we know where we want brackets for street signs and all that stuff. If it's right. in an area where you need a, a siren, then it's probably pole B that's a different structure and different shape so right. that it supports exactly. siren, right? So yeah, I just don't have a good feel for if somebody does come in, what's the density and where would they put these things? Are they, you know, do they need them? In this area, or is it the northwest corner, or is it? Uh, that's where I don't have a good feel for, like you said. So Mr. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mayor. So, uh, Commissioner Alder, the um, <coughs> that's what I'd like to see out of this is what questions would you like Liz to do more research on, to come back with, to help craft this, so that we have something that is effective for the city, but also something that the the, the vendors find reasonable to work with. We you know, craft something that covers us financially and aesthetically and is a sound document that, that they can say we can support that. And so what other questions? Those are good questions as to <clears throat> what density we're we looking at, what typical height. You know, you're looking here on, on street lights, they're saying up to 50 feet. You know, what are we saying? You know, if, if we put a remote siren, if you look at some of them, Ramsey, they're typically on a tall utility pole. Ours happens to be on a larger pole here. But what would remote siren pole need to be? What what other information would you like to see gathered? Communities like ours, rural communities. Um, you know, what's the spacing? What's the pole height? Oh, I, I think it'd be reasonable to see what else Planner and Stockton could find on the submerged one be, because maybe in the areas where there aren't poles, and they may want to, rather than putting in poles, they may want to go underground. If, if they can, the underground connect with the above ground to keep the relay going. 
and that way you could you could balance that out. These areas, people are proud of the fact that all utilities are underground. And right. the last thing they want is something coming above ground. Chair? Yes, uh, Mr. Burrow. Um, the one thing that came to mind when I was looking at the underground one was how, I mean, obviously they're underground, and they're, they're going to send out a signal, but we get so much snow. How could you possibly protect this? Um, from those elements, and I'm, and, I, and it says that was an Oaks, California, on this brochure. They don't get snow. Yeah, get, it could be that the, the freezing cold is not good for this. Yeah, no that's what my concern is. So, I mean, I, I don't know, but those are things that play a question. Although it doesn't affect our cell towers, I guess, but the cold. The, cut, the aesthetics, yes, having it underground is. Is nice because along with all of our underground utilities that we currently have, but can this happen in our climate? Looks Good pretty question. insulated. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How well does it work if there's three feet of snow over there? Whatever the, they have no, right, coming right. out of the ground there, yeah. So and could we use it as a fallout shelter? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, and <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I guess could we? I guess one thought too is could we say that if you're going to put these up, they have to be. Everyone has to be. Uh, we designate the type of pole that they that we want, and uh, everyone has to include a streetlight. If we, were, we wanted near an intersection, then be a streetlight. Mm -hmm. um, I, there sure would be nice on, on some of these uh, Conroe Road intersections to have uh, <coughs> lights on them. What you can do is designate streets. So you could say on, you know, old biking, you know, whatever, and list actual street names for the streets that have to have lights. And then maybe some of the local streets that are all residential don't necessarily need them or want them. So you can specify. So not necessarily every street has to have a street light or every pole, but you can have areas. You can do it by area, by uh, and that's where it kind of depends too on what their what their anticipated density is. I mean, right, if right. they mm -hmm. if these are because your cell towers are ten miles apart and they need you know two in between to be only uh, two miles apart, or you're in the dense areas of Minneapolis and that's where they're trying to get in between buildings and that's where they add these uh, once again basically to break to flex right down streets um, that maybe. They're never going to want to come out here anyway because our cell tower coverage is fine enough. Right. Mr. Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes, Mayor. So the other question I would ask is how many likely providers would there be? I mean, we, we're kind of thinking that one person, one company is going to come out here and do all of them, but would competing companies come out, and it, which again would be nice to have in our regulations, what type of pole, so it didn't matter if two different companies were competing for the business out here. Our look is going to be similar, depending on what we know. The size of the boxes they can put up there, they might be slightly different in appearance, but they're no, going to be no bigger than this, according to the state statute. Um, the other thing that they're not necessarily going to go to those areas where right now we're having trouble with CenturyLink. You know, this may not be a Rogers Lake. You know, they're, they're probably going to stick to major arteries where they have denser populations. Mm -hmm. So it'd be nice to know. How many might be coming in, and what would be their strategy in covering an area like now then? You know, when, when CenturyLink got their Connect America fund, they had to get as many homes as they could within a couple year period. So they targeted areas that had nothing where they would likely get service and put their nodes in up in the northern end where people didn't have competing service right now. Got more homes signed up, it, it served their purposes. What would be the strategy of these companies if? If we need to know who they are, who's doing this right now?
is, I guess I'm slightly confused. Is this totally underground, or is this just feet? Or is that actually right up there on top of that pole? Commissioner Schiller was saying, if you look at the pole there above the ball field, it looks like right. they're using it as a light pole, but the antenna is up on the <coughs> top. Of the pole, so the you equipment's don't. underground, but it's just a small antenna up on top. Mm -hmm. Right. <coughs> yeah, I agree. That's what it looks like. Mr. Chair? Yes, Mayor. Again, Ms. Stockman, on uh, the example you have from Cincinnati, mm -hmm. so does that, it appears to end there at, uh, on page 16, other discussion items? So up until that point, it's the Cincinnati example. Uh, Cincinnati, I just gave you, yeah, between. Or Cincinnati, just that one paragraph uh, on 15. No, the defining types of applications based on levels, I really liked on page 15 how they had three types of applications. And so that's from the Cincinnati example. That is from Cincinnati. And then the other discussion items are yours <laughs> saying, here's other things to consider? Yeah, and those were just bits and pieces that stood out to me as I were, was reading other ordinances. Okay. I mean, some have to do these elaborate, um, as-built type uh, and tracer wires to, you know, put into the city's GIS systems, um, mapping all their utilities and everything. Do you do this type of work? Are you going to be still above? Do you do this type of work? I guess we're going to be still above. We, we're in, we get involved in, you know, installing these poles and stuff like that. We don't do the cell portion, portion of it, but we get involved in the engineering portion of it putting other things on these poles with the cell towers. That's why I said Rosemont's is actually in the midst of it like right now. Rosemont, you said? He is right now, yeah. Lomotin's done quite a few of them, and so has Eden Prairie, and they're all on steel poles, and they look pretty pretty nice. Who's the, which carriers are doing them? Um, we do it through, um, like, like, Vinco and stuff like that. So we get brought in from the cities make these cell companies um, use us to put to, to do the rest of the stuff for them, like the civil defense stuff. So it might be Verizon, it might be AT&T, I don't know. So you're just working for the installation group and whoever's using them. They could, they could be co-locating, they could be a number of yeah. summarize Liz's homework here if we give her a lot of action items. So I'm you want me to read through it? Yeah, so what, what are the next steps here? Well, to do more research on some of the details. Um, a, what are there other rural, rural areas or cities similar to now then that have these in place? Um, the density, how many poles are needed, the spacing, the height, what is a typical height? Um, questions about the submerged model. Is this possible in Minnesota, given our climate? Um, do the underground models communicate with the above ground models? Uh, is the spacing any different for the underground versus the above ground? Uh, number, pro number of providers. Are there competing companies, just like there are for s the big cell towers? Um, let's see. Uh, location strategies, do they desire to locate uh, in denser areas based on population or along busier streets? Kind of what is their strategy for covering a city like now then? And then what companies are doing this now? And we have 
Rosemount, Eden Prairie as a couple examples that I have not looked at. And there were some suggestions on the uh, western suburbs where you have open spaces but a little more. Okay. More. Uh, oh yeah, I had higher right, end homes. Right County down. Yeah, with like like Rockford even or something like that might. Uh, yeah, Rockford. Hamill, Corcoran, Hassan Township. Well, Hassan portion of Rogers. Yeah, but there's no Hamill. Oh, Hamill? Why did Medina take them over? For years. Did they? Oh, yeah. They still got the thing, but there is no city of Hamill. And then, uh, could we look at our, what our strategy would be? Because we talked about what our strategy be. Um, could we combine functions for a siren? We talked about street signs. Or could it be where there isn't poles? Was, would we put those at intersections where we we where we would like a street light, and that could be the the strategy and how we get street lights or city signs or I like the idea of a a siren if it's in the areas where there isn't current great coverage. Yeah, I agree. I rarely hear it when I was Yeah. Ever. So I have woods on the west side too, so it doesn't help me either if it's coming from town here. So. And I'm not yeah. but our zoning regulations don't allow storms up in the area, though. Do <laughs> <laughs> you remember about seven years ago, I had this building fall in my kennel building up there? <laughs> yeah, but that was a violation of the ordinance of the zoning. <laughs> yeah, the wood came out of the northeast for that storm. That was an That's right. That was, um, it was, it was not a certified uh, thing <clears> to throat> come throat> out of that direction with wind. Well, you could, you could actually have them both, but it would be tougher for them to, to come out here right now unless you got like higher density areas where there's housing and stuff. Because my understanding of some of these is they're, they put them next to football stadiums because there's a large gathering of people and you run out of lines, right? So they add capacity in those high density areas with that. Trying to understand is there actually even, is there, they may be boosters for those high capacity, but I don't know that they extend coverage from a dead zone to a dead zone. I don't, I don't know that they do that. I think they used a lot during the Super Bowl. But that was to add capacity because they had a high density of people. Because you know when you're in a, when you're in the stadium, your cell phone doesn't work because there's too many people all in one area. So that's why they add these things. I don't know that. It actually works if you say, well, we've got a dead zone in this area. We need to add one of these. I don't believe that's what the function of this is. I believe the function of this is if you're in a super high density area where there's a lot of people, you run out of capacity for cell service and you add these booster things to add more lines to the area. I don't think this works for, hey, we have a low coverage zone, three miles from here, put, a, put one of these stations up. I, I don't think it works that way. I, I'm... Um, understood it to be both uses, Is it both? and I also understood it to be um, the future of cars that drive themselves and having that reception, okay, and all that kind of thing. Yeah, okay. so kind of multiple up and coming things we never would have thought of when we were born. Okay. The end is why you want to be ahead of it, because right. But I will clarify for sure. Okay. Lots of questions. And I'll show you that the rumor that Elon Musk is looking at a building in town. What's that? I can't confirm that Elon Musk is looking at a building in town for his cars, but I won't deny it either. <laughs> I didn't get it either. But yeah, who the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> Self-driving cars, the Tesla. Oh, yeah. No, we're not in California. Elon Musk has, it builds a Tesla. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Already have a facility. <laughs> <laughs> it's a secret one. We're not supposed to talk about it. Is that enough news to start with? Oh, oh yeah, that'll keep me busy. <laughs> it feels like a lot. So you're just going to do some more research and... Sure. I think, we, yeah, we definitely need to answer some questions. We don't have, we don't have to table this for another time, just... No, it wasn't. We just have to... Okay. Just discussion. Okay. Thanks for the information. Thank you.
<coughs> it, the thing is, what I can see here, we've we got to get heads up now because this is coming in and it's going to affect us mm -hmm. probably sooner than we think. I think so. And, and the trouble is there's not enough cities right now is our heads up starting to work on it. Well, it's kind of like when the wind generators are starting to come around and stuff, and the city of Ramsey had to hurry up and jump in and put a regulation on all of it so nobody could have them. Well, I don't want to have that either, so. No, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Well, okay, should we go on then? What do you have here sure. for, for a list of exhibits? Well, if you have any questions about the any of the upcoming projects. Um, do want to highlight the comprehensive plan workshop coming up on May 9th and hope to see you all there. Uh, we really need to finalize our land use plan. Uh, we have invited Met Council to be there, so that'll be interesting. Um, the last day, Commissioner or Chair. Yes. Um, in response to that, I will let you know that I will not be able to attend. Oh, okay. I will be out of state. Okay, um, and I've known that for a while now, and it just dawned on me by looking at the calendar. <laughs> okay. If I could just chat with you yes. after the meeting, that'd be great. Okay. Um, but so, yeah, we will be trying to define our land use plan for through 2040, how our city will look, um, proposing that it be without the diversified rural we'd like City Council would like most of the city or all of the city to be rural residential. Um, some of the other things we'll talk about is, you know, the perspectives and now then have residents' views changed at all? Um, do generally we still want now then to be rural? Um, so we'll kind of go through our comp plan from 2009 and see if those views are the same and plan accordingly. So just a general update, but the, definitely the land use piece is the biggest hurdle at this point. Mr. Uh, Chair? Yes, Mayor. So everybody should have received a packet, either online or hard copy. Um, in the packet, you'll see a, a letter that was sent at, to a previous comp plan meeting that we had the mayor and the council from uh, Kent Raisler uh, suggesting a trial area of one acre lots and now that it's, um, if you're not aware Mr. Raisler and three of his neighbors have requested a detachment from the city of now then and that they would become part of the city of Oak Grove this reflects about 600 acres that would leave now then and, and move over to Oak Grove so the corner of 47 and 22 would basically become Oak Grove. Um, Mr. Farb, who has been in here before uh, with commercial industrial request, um, is part of that uh, request, petition. Oak Grove has uh, approved their resolution that was presented to them by Mr. Raisler. And so there's a property owner in Oak Grove, who has about 150 acres, 120 acres in now then that adjoins this property in Oak Grove. So he signed on to it. Um, Eldon Farb, and then uh, Cash Farms, that owns the 10 acres with the, the dryers on the corner of 22 and 47. So the four of them have all petitioned. Now since 1959, uh, exchange of land between cities, uh, there's been a total of 791 acres. They're going for 600 acres in one shot. So in 40 years, they've only done this, you know, less than eight, fewer than 800 acres have actually switched. But they are petitioning at this point to detach from the city of Nalden. Now, one of the, the questions that came up is, you know, why does he want to go to Oak Grove? Because he can get two and a half acre parcels. So his land becomes that much more val valuable. He did suggest that we, want, we, may, we may want to consider one acre parcels. I don't you think have to already tried and I'll stick together. Huh? We've already tried that. As far as smaller parcels? One acre's been in now then for years. Yeah. You've got Jasper Street in there, back in there. That's been one acre for many, many years. 
and the reason it didn't get developed in there for a while was that the town board at that time kind of pulled a sneaky on them and told them they could only develop every other lot. And it went for years that way that there was every other lot wasn't developed in there. And you go back there to this day and you'll see what one acre is, is compared to. You go right on the... On the well, I know, and, and our, our engineer has said, you know, back when this discussion was had before, when we were in the Musa district there, the engineer had said, if you're going to have a, a self-contained septic system and a backup site, his minimum would be a, an acre and a quarter. Because yeah, see, there's only 43, 560 in every acre. That's all you've got. It's 208 by 208. And you take a house out of that in a septic system, and there's not much left. Yeah. Mr. Chair? Yes. Well, are, you, are you through? I was just going to say that, so what, what the planner's saying is that's part of the discussion we're going to have. What do the residents of now then think now as far as development? And, and that's the discussion we're going to have at is, this is workshop. Is there something that people are looking for. You know, people that are retirement age want to still live in now then, but they don't want to maintain five acres in a larger home. What are the opportunities out here? This is the time to discuss it because, again, as we talked about before, the comp plan is our guiding document, and from that we get our ordinances, our zoning regulations, and our policies. So this really is the overriding document. So it's really critical that we get this right going forward for the next the 2040 plan. And we have to have this done sometime yet this year. So. My, my question is on that now, if the Metropolitan Council is basically controlling the size of our lots right now, am I not right on that? We've told them what we will do. But they want 10 acres. They wanted more than that, even further back than that. And you get up in like Northern Elk River, where they're not guided by the Met Council, but they're Northern portion is 20 acre minimum. No, I think in northern Ramsey you've got a pretty large lot size. Larger than what ours is. I, I think they were there. I'm not certain, but I thought when they did this development um, was it right by the church there? No. Um, Esther Martin's place. Esther Martin, but see that, that, that had a special deal on that and there's also kind of like what we have our, there's one particularly large lot out of that parcel too because there's around 56 acres I believe in that parcel and there's not going to be you know, very many houses maybe five or six in that whole parcel so that's an, I think they had to have a variance for that though for I think they did but you got to remember who you were dealing with there who were you dealing with Wayne Davis. Oh. And Wayne Davis has been known for the years to usually get his way of, he knows about how to go about getting things done. Because the greenhouse wouldn't be the size it is today if he did. But he must remember that. But, I mean, I'm not saying nothing against him, but he usually figures a way around, you know. And I think there was some give and take to that whole operation, is what there was. When they got it, but you got to think about that because now if they decide to take Oak, what the parcel of now then and put it into Oak Grove, is that parcel going to be have two and a half acre lots, or is yes. it going to have five acre lots? Two and a half. Two and a half. Is it, that's but what the Metropolitan Council won't approve probably it? won't approve that, will they? Doesn't matter. They, they've they've already they're already designated that in Oak Grove. Throughout City of Oak Grove, it's two and a half acres. And they, they got a special legislative exemption to get Met Council out of their southern portion. They actually tailored a law just for Oak Grove to keep them out of the city completely. So, so they, they are, now I think Mr. Farben, and we still know, Corey, if we're still cleared, if he's going ahead with them and just doesn't want to deal with the council, or is he <coughs> pulling out of that? No, he backed. Yeah, he backed out um, with them all together okay. right now. Well, his discussion with him was right now. 
So it was almost like it could be on again, but let's just back up right now. So he, he included the 60 acres that he wanted redeveloped as industrial here. And he was, he was concerned because we wanted a frontage road in there, but there's not another parcel that we would get platted out in this city which we wouldn't put in roads. So I don't know where anybody's going to develop 60 acres and not put in roads, but, but he, he considered that part of his problem. But he also took his 40 acres across on the southwest corner of 47 and 22 and included that in the detachment request. So we would have a really odd border there. You know, as you go down 47, yep. some of the houses on the right would be now then, and some of the land on the right would be Oak Grove. So it, it doesn't, it's not a very pretty thing. And if we jumped across 47, now you've got this 40 acres that goes down to Fort Brook that would be this little peninsula of Oak Grove sticking into the There's community. many parcels in there that water stands quite a bit of the year in different areas in there. Yep. And the same thing on, on Mr. Ressler's parcel. There's quite a few parcels in there that are pretty wet in there different times of the year. And I, I wouldn't think that the sewer would work real good in all of those areas without mound systems. Now that requires more acreage too. Yep. So it, it could be a very, very interesting time. Mr. Chair. Yes. What I was going to say previously too is there's a lot more to it. If we change the lot sizes and go smaller, uh, we have to look at things. Um, do we want that to be exclusive of wetlands? Because right now we allow a five acre piece to have wetlands as part of it. But if we're going that small, that isn't going to work. And I don't believe that an acre and a quarter is enough. Um, personally, just from what I see, people want accessory structures. I mean, we're going to have to limit a lot size like that, of course, with accessory structure size similar to uh, Morton Farm Preserve. But, um, yeah, excluding wetlands is part of it. Uh, we would have to adjust lot widths, lot depths, because our current minimum lot widths and depths are 300 and 300. So, um, yeah, it, it would require a lot of ordinance work, too, to, to change that. Mr. Chair, do you remember what happened over here? Oh, we got to go back probably seven, eight years ago. And we had all those lots from that guy from Champlin that was part of what was the Paul Krieger, or not Paul, but um, our, um, Lawrence Krieger's investment. And remember, we were going to put gopher, or he was going to put gopher piles out there. Remember that? You know, you put so much dirt in for each house. Oh. Yeah, well, this is before your time, Liz. I do know what you're talking about, though. Yeah. Because I've looked. Yeah, there's quite a quite a large chunk of land. Mm -hmm. See, that never it w wasn't feasible because of the dollars of making the gopher pile. See, that's peat ground over there. It's peat and a lot of it, yeah. And when you start doing that, then you you end up like they it's do over there. east of sixty five, and they made more uh, uh, lakes. Is what they actually did over there. So. But all this is going to enter into this thing here when we get into this cutting down our size, you know. Well, and, and obviously, you know, Mr. Rachel owns land on the west part of the city, and he's... That's right, that's next. Huge developments going in, in Elk River adjacent to that land right now, so... That's we want to be wise. Um, then again, one of the things that's going to come up is there's, there's a lot of contention over the frontage road plan, item number three, on Liz's uh, memo. Um, so you're going to want to think hard about that one. What does the what does the city want to guide when it comes to our intersections? Um, this, this originally came in because, again, the best time to guide people is before developments in place, and and it's not a hard fast rule, but you want some kind of frontage road. You know, Mr. Farb was, was concerned that we wanted a road in his 60 acres, but really, you can't develop any acreage without road access to it. The, the question is, do we want to become like some of the other communities, and if you drive in Ramsey much, you find yourself making U-turns in the middle of Highway 10 and Highway 47 and Bunker, and 
there, there's a lot of U-turns to get into businesses right on the corners because they don't have any access roads that were planned and the other buildings came up right to them, residential, quite often. So to get into the commercial properties, the, real, the retail properties on the corners, requires U-turns. And it's really a pain when somebody's trying to get to that left turn light and realize somebody's stopping dead in front of them to make a U-turn. Because we haven't developed yet, the consideration was, do we want to have that as part of our guidance as people develop on these corners in areas that will eventually become divided roadways? Um, there are those in the council that are vehemently opposed to this. Um, there are those that think the concept is a good idea as long as it doesn't stop development. As a planning commission, you're going to want to weigh in on that. What do you think of access roads that get people into commercial properties without requiring a lot of a lot of U-turns in the middle of major intersections? It was based on yeah the county spacing requirements to start with. So. Right, but potential upgrades to 22 right. at some point and having. Mm -hmm. Um, limitations on what you can put that uh, the driveway is only a half mile away. So. Right. But we wouldn't allow 60 acres of residential to go without a street, so why would we allow that for commercial or industrial? Um, but the update on Mr. Farb, um, he, he had a... You know, Mr. Josh Peterson was here and was requesting that rezoning. Uh, then they canceled the purchase agreement and parted ways for a short time. Must have been during this annexation talk. But now they're, Mr. Peterson has an offer to buy all of the 60 acres. And he wishes to come back through again with just 20 acres for a rezoning. So, um, after having been denied, the council has to make a determination whether the request is, I forget the wording, different or has changed enough to warrant a new rezoning request. Um, What's the normal waiting period? Um, well, I forget. I don't think that has a waiting period. Well, it may have a waiting period of a year unless the council determines otherwise. But he would like to address some of the concerns that were raised previously. And part of it was not knowing what was going to happen to the remaining part of the land. So this time he would like to propose all the 20 acres and show you know what will happen. So I'm waiting for a concept, and we'll go from there. So we've got a lot kind of coming up. We've got Mr. Udy, who was requesting a lot split on Gypsy Valley. Um, and I believe, yeah, the planning and zoning is a negative recommendation. Um, he pulled his original application and has reapplied uh, with a variance as was recommended by the city attorney. So not only has he requested the split, the conditional use permit for the flag lot, and the variance was required because he doesn't own the piece out to Gypsy Valley. It's an easement. So it would be a second lot on an existing easement. Um, so, we have a lot of interesting things coming up. We have uh, Mr. Clemmer put up a pole barn on 183rd Avenue, which is in the wrong place. Um, long story. But he would like to request a variance <coughs> to try to, so that he doesn't have to move the pole barn. Uh, his property? Pardon me? Is it on his property? Uh, it's on his property, yes, but it's within the required setback. So, and I don't mean a little bit. I mean about two-thirds of the building. 
Uh, anyway, we had Did a lot. Did you get a permit for the building? Yes. And, and just built it in the wrong place. Yeah, he, I had, yeah, he had, he and I had prepared a site plan and talked about where it was going to go, and then he had part of the problem was he had a new septic system put in next to his house, which kind of pushed the building over where it could be, you know. But he never came to the city and talked about it. He just he and his contractor decided to rotate it. Well, they rotated it toward the kind of the curb street, so it got closer on um, that side. So, and it's on top of a power line, so he's got issues. But um, <laughs> so that's a, that that's a big excitement. <laughs> You're gonna be gone. Yeah, coming <laughs> out of town. Uh, we had the discussion that, you know, the city's not obligated to correct his boo-boos by a variance. And he said he really wants to apply and see um, what he can do. Uh, but, you know, it's a, it's a unfortunate situation. He realizes that he goofed up. Um, it is a dead-end road. I don't, it's... There's only one house that is on the end where the building is too close. And he claims that property owner is okay with it. You know, whether or not that's really justification, that's up to you guys. Buy the property and change the property line. Yeah. You know, it's next to the road is the issue. Yeah, I think he There's a, that power line. It's a little bit power line is an issue. That is one of the, the things with the regulation, the variance is it can't be of the owner's own doing. Yeah, we had that discussion, and it's a uh, it is unfortunate. I I don't know. At any rate, um, he's getting a survey done, and he's got a we got to know exactly where it sits right now. And let's see. Some of you remember Mr. Greenwald. They were in here the end of last year with a concept for a split along 181st. They have are moving forward and getting some missing pieces filled in. Um, the Kohler property on Baugh also has a concept for 80 acres. Um, and I don't know, I got a call from what I, who I think is maybe one of the um, daughters, maybe, of the Kohlers. I'm not sure, but she had a bunch of questions. They did hire an engineer and a surveying firm to do the concept, and then she was questioning lot sizes and that kind of thing. So I talked with her about that. But um, And then the Volunteers of America up on Norris Lake Road, they are selling off more property behind um, Bar Nun, and there's some questions there relative to wetlands and access. You know, if the property do, property doesn't even have access, you know, we're not going to allow it to be split off and just sit back there. So we're working on that. Might suggest if they want to detach, Oak Grove is in there, willing to take <laughs> any and all comers. <laughs> Yes, we could just give them that whole development there. <laughs> so, good idea. <laughs> I suggested that to the mayor over there. He's not real excited about that, but he did say on record, anybody who wants to do this, he thinks they should be able to do it. Oh, my gosh. Anybody from St. Francis that wants to take part of Oak Grove, they'll help you out. Well, I'll tell you, like you said, it is not very common for a city to take land from a city. It's very common to have to take land from a township if you have something to offer like sewer and water. But well, St. Francis can offer sewer and water and they need a little help with their water treatment anyway. So mm -hmm. I think it could oh, go either Grove way. Estates, high density apartments. <laughs> <laughs> you got How, does out. that have any effect on schools? I mean are they already in the Oak Grove school district? St. Francis. Uh, Oak Grove's in the St. Francis School District. Okay, I sorry, I guess I really don't know. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know without looking at a map. Okay. I knew we were split between there? three. 
Yeah, we're split. They're, they're, they're very southernmost part might be down in the Andover area. But, oh, okay. But Cedar and most of most of Ino Oak Grove is okay. right over to East Bethel. So St. Francis too, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, okay. How much land is the uh, volunteers looking to? A lot, like. It, did Jerry Bowers buy that? They bought some last time, yeah. Yeah, and, they, and guess what? He's running his business again. It's mm -hmm. illegal too. Yep. And they won't do anything unless somebody complains. Uh, well, somebody's no. complained. Yeah, they're well, on Somebody it. already has complained? They're on it. Oh, oh send them oh. to Oak Grove. They're on it. Yeah. yeah. No, he was here and got He was violated trouble. here, and so he bought land in Oak Grove on the border. Mm -hmm. So we were watching to see where he put his buildings up because we knew he'd start the business again. Huh. And he put it up on the Oak Grove side, and somebody in Oak Grove noticed it. And so you guys just send all your misfits to Oak Grove? <laughs> 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 I know nothing. <laughs> I see nothing. Not I can say that on record because I don't know these people. <laughs> I'm new no. here. Uh, but you'll know what we mean if, if we, somebody suggests you go into Old Grove, you'll know what we think of you. So. Right. Well, I'm closer to Ramsey, so send me that way. I would say it was at least 100 acres they were going to sell off, something like that. But that can't be all real high, is it? No, it's wet. That's why I say it's... Is that right along the and north? And they're trying to get away with not doing a delineation. And I said, oh, no, I have to know if this is even accessible. So, yeah. Well, they own part of North uh, or Oak Grove too, there, too, because that's right in the border. Bar Nano is part in Oak Grove and part in now then. Yeah, see, see if the first building you go into is Oak Grove. I, I read Everything that. else is now then. That's why we get all the calls. Because they always make sure if anybody's in trouble, it's not in that first building. And we get, we're get we getting all the sheriff's calls. Well, get this, though. There's one building that actually straddles the lot line, and they're doing renovations, so they had to pull a permit in both cities. <laughs> well, isn't True there, story. Isn't there a little piece in St. Francis, too, on the line there? <coughs> Well, some of their land was, but they, I think they've sold that off. They may have gotten, oh, yeah, they did north of North Lake. At one point, there was yes. three, mm -hmm. yeah, three, three uh, townships involved. Yeah, they sold the, yeah. the stuff north of Norris Lake. Okay. Right, yeah, they did sell that off. So, lots the of Mad excitement. The Madsen lot split? Yeah. Oh, Mr. Madsen, you know, has a business on Norris Lake Road. Is that the one over by me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, black dirt? No, up on east yeah. or west side, Norris Lake Road. Not you're not Nathan oh, Madsen. So no, 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 the other one. That, uh, Steve Madsen. Yeah, Madsen. Steve. Yeah, he's my neighbor. No, yeah, he's not. just down the road from me, about three quarters of a mile. Oh, well, okay. by now then standards, he's his neighbor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> by city standards, he's in a whole different community. <laughs> Just trying to make Steve, that Steve Madsen's. He's he's got yeah. the mining going on there. And he yeah. wants he wants to split. Well, he's yeah he's going through a divorce, so it, it might be a while because he I don't think he can split or sell until that's final and then. Because he but, he has two buildings in the place. Well, he has multiple buildings, but he wants to sell. Yeah, the existing two houses. house. There's two existing houses. Existing house and the pole barn, and then he wants to build a new house on the west half. Okay. So. But, and then he's also got some wetland work he has to do that was a violation. Not a wetland. So, anyway. <coughs> Lots of fun. <clears throat> Anything else? No, it's, it's important that comprehensive plan that we all show up for that door, that, uh, in March. It would Are really we, be helpful, yeah. May, May 9th. May 9th. Mm -hmm. May 9th. Because that's very important that uh, so we don't have a lot of input into that. Seven. 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 No, yeah. Wednesday. It's Wednesday night, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Seven o'clock, he said. Yeah. Seven o'clock. Okay. okay. Yep. And Corey, do we have uh, code books for everybody yet? Everybody. Have we got a code book? Oh, the new people? I would, I would recommend bringing those because... And again, our guiding is we're going to go to comp plan, codes, ordinances, and codes. 
we have it. Does it have a set of time or anything? I just, my husband's out of town, so I need to make sure the baby's there. I would just say a couple hours for sure, but I mean, you, don't, I, you wouldn't have to stay till. I'm ready for it. I can't it. do that. Uh, I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. <laughs> a motion was made by. I'm trying to think of your name right now. Alder. Alder. Anybody second this motion? Second. Okay. Commissioner Wagner seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's adjourned. We have to change the to the We're upset about that. Over there. Turn the